So uh, thanks everyone for coming out to my talk. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the future of front-end development in OpenEdX, also known as FedEx. Uh, I ask that you please hold questions till the end. Going to leave about 10 minutes for discussion. Uh, I'm also running a BOF session tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. in the breakfast area. Would love to chat with all of you. All right, so a little bit about myself. My name is Ari. I am a senior front-end engineer um, on the edX core team. Uh, I work in accessibility, which by necessity is front-end. Um, and so FedEx itself is a working group within edX, meaning it's not a particular team. It's more a collection of... Uh, people with shared interests. And our mission as a group is to empower the edX development community by continually defining, evangelizing, and supporting front-end best practices. edX development community, that means edX.org, but also all of you. All right, so I'm going to go over uh, the existing state of the front-end, uh, some of the pain points inherent there. Uh, talk kind of at a high level about our approach for cleaning that up and making it easier to work with, and sneak preview at some of the new technologies uh, that we're starting to adopt. All right, so let's jump right in to prior art. So uh, the edX platform, the open edX platform is a Django application. And as such, it does a lot of rendering on the server side. Uh, this is um, just basic HTML rendered into template files. Because it's Django, a lot of it is done through Django templates, uh, as well as Mako templates. And if you've uh, modified the OpenEdX front end at all, I'm sure you're very familiar with these. Client side, we've got a little bit more going on. Uh, We've got SAS, which we use to build our uh, style sheets. We have a healthy dose of jQuery, both um, old style kind of ad hoc jQuery classes, um, as well as sprinkled throughout our, our other views. Uh, backbone and underscore. And uh, although it's technically deprecated, we still do have a decent uh, amount of CoffeeScript left to clean up. Uh, some of you may also be familiar with the UX pattern library, which is an initiative that the edX front-end team took on um, a while back. It's uh, our attempt at a CSS framework and UX style guide and HTML style guide, kind of all in one approach uh, to best practices for front-end development. And uh, that defines official brand colors, styles, um, fonts. There's a couple patterns in there, specific patterns. Uh, adoption is on the low side. It's only within uh, at the out-of-the-box uh, edX platform. It's only in a few views. Um, and you can see more details on that at ux.edx.org. And um, asset management. So it's all done through Django. Uh, everything is built via Django's asset pipeline. This means our SAS and CSS, uh, as well as our JavaScript compilation, CoffeeScript compilation. And uh, if you've worked with it before, particularly on a dev stack, uh, you might be familiar with how slow it can be. All right, so that's a great jumping off point, I think, for some of the pain points involved with working on the open edX front end. Uh, performance is a big one, and performance matters because it's not just developers that have to deal with it, it's also our users. Our users see um, bad performance, it can really affect someone's experience on the platform. Uh, our pages are somewhat heavy, uh, we have a decent amount of static assets that get served with every page. Um, our, our style sheets are big. Because they're cached, it's 
Usually not such a big deal, but uh, on a first page load, especially on a mobile device, it's pretty slow. Uh, this uh, also, um, most of the time spent displaying a page is in the rendering, in the um, like painting that happens in the DOM. And this, is, this becomes much, much worse, exponentially worse uh, on a mobile browser or a slow network connection, which are both use cases that we care a lot about. So this is a standard um, average uh, page view load time for all the pages across uh, the Open edX platform um, on edX.org. And you can see the numbers might be a little small, but it hovers around um, six seconds, which isn't terrible, but it's not great either. Um, but if you, if you look, most of that time is spent in DOM processing and page rendering. There's a lot going on in every page load. Take a look at this, though. This is the native Android browser. Look at those numbers, 15 seconds. 15 seconds to load a page. Uh, would, would any of you wait around for that? I don't think I would. Uh, and again, that uh, DOM processing and page rendering is, is much, much greater here. Uh, queuing and web application, those still are pretty, pretty low, but the, the rendering is really the, the pain point there. Also, um, slow network connections. So, in the US and most of Europe, we're all in the green here. Uh, we get decent uh, page load speeds uh, for all of these pages. But if you look at um, some of the slower areas, uh, most of Africa, good amount of South America, um, those are areas that don't necessarily have access to the fast internet connections that we're used to and we kind of take for granted. Um, and that we develop for, because that's what we use. Uh, so this is, this is kind of a, a problematic uh, map, I would say. Uh, accessibility is another big concern. Uh, edX, as an organization, is very committed to providing accessible software, both to uh, learners and then, as uh, Shelby mentioned earlier, uh, on the uh, studio side as well. But accessibility is kind of a hard problem. Solving it requires a lot of domain knowledge. Uh, you really have to know what you're doing. Um, you need a deep understanding of the ways um, users, disabled users uh, may uh, or may not use the platform. So this is a big um, developer pain point. And as there's code duplication throughout the code base, say um, multiple, a big one for us is multiple um, modal uh, dialogue widgets. The more modal dialogue widgets we have, the more we have to confirm that all of them are accessible. And um, when you only have one person on staff who has that domain knowledge, uh, it, it can really, really add up. Uh, maintenance, so uh, this is a chimera. It is a mythical creature made of multiple different animals in one body. Um, multiple heads, all very angry, all very dangerous. And uh, I feel like for the Open edX front end, this is kind of an apt metaphor. We've got our coffee script, we've got our jQuery, we've got our backbone, uh, we've got a lot going on there. And um, not everyone understands all of that right out of the box. Uh, there are areas of the code base, I've been with edX about six months, there are several areas that I still don't fully understand. And imagine what that's like for someone who's just starting off with the platform. It, it's not super developer friendly. Um, and it, this, is, this is not a problem that's unique to open edX. It happens really with any large code base but it tends to be particularly bad with the front end because front end technology moves so fast, it's hard to sort of keep up. But um, we want to fix this. So um, how are we going to do it? So our goals um, within FedEx 
Uh, with our, our changes to the Open edX front end, we want an optimal experience for all of our users. This means slow network connections. This means um, mobile devices. Uh, this also means um, users with disabilities. We want to develop with maintenance in mind. Like I said, front end moves super fast. And if we think about things less in terms of this one particular framework and more as uh, separate concerns, it, it becomes easier to build an application that's easy to maintain. And uh, last but not least, we want to make it easy and enjoyable for developers to contribute to the OpenEdX front end. Internally, that applies to uh, our staff developers, but it also means all of you. All right, so um, here's our approach. Uh, I don't know if any of you are as much fans of trash pop culture American news as I am, but if you are, uh, you'll recognize uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's conscious uncoupling. I like to think of it more as conscious decoupling in more of a software sense. So what does this mean? Uh, we, instead of an all-in-one solution to the front end, we want to decouple uh, the concerns that um, don't necessarily need to depend on each other. So we've got, we've got multiple components to this. We've got data, we've got business logic, and we've got the appearance of the pages. And those three things definitely overlap. They definitely relate to each other, but they don't all need to depend on each other. So how do we make this work? Uh, we think of it more as, less as an all-in-one application and more as loosely coupled services, um, kind of like a mini distributed system. Uh, we maintain integration points in between the three of them so that each service internally can change independently without breaking everything else. Uh, so what, is, what does that mean? So the data side of things, that's the content of the UI. Um, this is stuff you might get from the server or uh, from user input. It uh, informs the business logic. And our integration points there are web APIs. The data might get sent over from the server. Um, or user input, that's, that is data as well. If you type into a form, that, that's data that we have to store. The business logic layer is um, how does the front end behave and how is it organized. This is generally handled in the JavaScript and the HTML. It's very important for this layer to be well maintained. It has to be consistent um, so that it lines up well with the data side and the appearance side. Um, accessibility lives here as well. And uh, best practices largely live in the, the logic layer as well. And our integration points here, again, um, the data layer, the web APIs, and uh, the way the DOM is organized so that uh, CSS selectors work consistently. And appearance, this is how the UI looks. This is pretty much all CSS. Uh, it needs to be extensible, and we want it to be themable, too. So a lot of people theme their OpenEdX instances. And this is just selectors. Um, CSS only really relates to the rest of the DOM with its selectors. And here's kind of a um, complex diagram of how it all works together. Um, you can see the data flow up from the server um, into the, the data layer. Um, business logic kind of handles generating the page, which then gets styled by appearance. And then user actions, form submissions, et cetera, those flow back down through the logic layer to the data layer over onto the server. All right, so um, this is probably why you're all here. Uh, we're going to talk about what's coming next for the OpenEdX front end. So a um, lot of good stuff here. Uh, the primary goal right now is to modernize our front end. We want to bring it up to date. We want to be using the cool new technology that uh, front end developers care about. We want to uh, attract that, those open source contributions that are going to make a difference in our platform. 
and we want to keep our own developers happy as well. Um, so ES2015 is the big one. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it is the current um, working specification of ECMAScript. It's super cool. You should all check it out if you haven't already. Um, basically, it is uh, a very sane way to write JavaScript. Um, we have classes, we have imports, um, all kinds of cool like, object and array operations. It's wonderful. Um, Bootstrap and uh, React, as Joel mentioned earlier, and then Webpack for bundling. Um, also, I want to call attention to Web Fragments, which some of you might have used. Uh, web Fragments are a way to generate pluggable user interfaces via Django application. And um, so this is Django code that renders some chunk of UI into your application. These are currently uh, used within the, the current working Xbox specification. Um, some of you may have used them. Um, they can also be embedded directly into the OpenEdX platform itself. And those uh, passed via OEP 12. Um, there's also, for all of these things I'm talking about, there's a lot of great documentation on the Confluence Wiki. I can send out a link to that later on if any of you are interested. Uh, Webpack is another big one. And this, this is really exciting. Uh, it's probably the most excited I've ever been about an asset management system. Uh, Webpack is the de facto standard for front-end asset management right now. It bundles uh, JavaScript as well as SAS or less if you're using that instead. Uh, the, the great part is it does not depend on Django. So you can run it independently. You, can, um, you don't have to depend on the Django asset pipeline itself to bundle Webpack code. Um, you can run it in a separate service if you like. Uh, let's chat more about that tomorrow morning if you're interested in how to do that. And it enables us to write that lovely modern ES2015 code uh, through Babel. Babel is a transpiler that um, makes this ES2015 code work in all browsers. Uh, bootstrap. So, uh, Bootstrap for CSS. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you might have used it. It's uh, kind of divisive among the development community. A lot of people are, um, think it has too generic of a feel to it. Bootstrap 4 uh, is coming out very soon. It's currently still in alpha, but there's a lot of great stuff in there. It, is, it contains a lot of mix-ins for um, not accessibility, uh, responsiveness, so working on mobile. It makes it extremely easy to style an application, but the best part is it is themable. It is built to be themable, and bootstrap themes are widely used, uh, and there's a ton of community support for bootstrap. So um, the beta of version 4 is coming out soon. Until then, uh, we're working off the alpha. If you've been paying any attention to uh, our open edX proposal about Bootstrap, you may have noticed um, there's a bit of debate going on about RTL styling. Um, we're planning on handling that via uh, a plugin, a community plugin, and then RTL is in Bootstrap's roadmap for release. So once they figure it out, then uh, we'll just get that for free. And if you're curious about this, please check out OEP 16. It is supposed to merge this week. So if you have input on this, uh, please do it now. React. Um, yeah, React, React is happening. OEP 11 merged a couple months ago, uh, meaning that future front-end development for the OpenEdX platform will be done via React.js. I encourage you to check out that OEP for a little bit of the reasoning behind that, how we arrived at the React conclusion. Uh, 
basically it encourages modularity and code reuse. Uh, React is built via components, which can then be extended or um, improved upon, and everything is encapsulated. JavaScript and HTML, um, all of that, that business logic lives in one place. It's easy to test in isolation. Uh, you can render individual components. You don't have to worry about you know, the whole page. And the best part is it interoperates very well with legacy code. This could be kind of a double-edged sword because you know, the easier it is to interoperate with legacy code, the less motivated people are to remove that legacy code. But um, for a platform uh, the size of edX, edX Platform's front end, we, we really need that. Um, so, yeah, and it's um, state managers can work well with legacy code as well. Um, I personally have used React alongside Bootstrap, and it works better than you'd think. So that's React. And this is the thing I'm most excited about, is we are testing out a React component library. And this means these are kind of like building blocks for UI, uh, reusable chunks of user interface to handle the kinds of UI challenges that may crop up at multiple points throughout the front end. So the example earlier, the modal dialog, the goal there is to have one modal dialog that we use where all of the accessibility concerns are just bundled together in one place. You don't have to worry about accessibility. You don't have to wait for an accessibility code review. Uh, you just drop it in, and it works. And those are going to be versioned semantically uh, so and available via NPM. We're still in the process of figuring out exactly how we want to do that. Uh, we're planning on proving it out first via Studio, and then um, if all goes well there, moving it into the LMS. Uh, but we're going to be very transparent about the development of this library. We definitely want your feedback, definitely want to hear from the community. Um, we want to know what, com what components you want to see, what components you would change, uh, et cetera. And we want to make sure that these are as themable as possible. They should work with existing themes, future themes, potential bootstrap themes. Yeah. All right, so we want to hear from you. I have talked to a handful of people here so far about what they're doing with the OpenEdX front end, and uh, I want to hear from more people. Tomorrow morning, um, birds of a feather session downstairs, 9 a.m. Um, there's a lot of people here, so I don't know really how well a group this large would work, but yeah, come uh, chat with us. Um, about front end as well as accessibility. Uh, Mark Sadecki will, will be there as well. There's a front end channel in the OpenEdX Slack. Check that out. Voice your concerns. I will post some links to relevant wiki pages. Uh, the edX code mailing list is another good place uh, to get involved. PRs are welcome, although not required. Uh, the OEP repo is a good place to uh, watch if you're curious about upcoming things going on with Frontend or elsewhere in the platform, too. And yeah, come, come chat. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it all goes towards JS templates? Yes. Have you come to a uh, conclusion as to whether you support detail or do you need to do a reference template? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, as it will be the reference template. For Mako versus Django templates versus uh, Jinja? Well, in Django templates have two processor backends. Mm -hmm. I am not aware of one at this time. Um, if 
I find out, I will tell you. Uh, but yeah. I remember it was discussed, and but I don't know if there's any plan to support that. Um, yes. I'm asking about the React and the web fragments because I don't think they will work well, right? React and web fragments. Yeah. Web fragments could be, or web fragments could render React components. React lives entirely on the front end. Yep. A web fragment is more a way to plug something in to an existing Django uh, workspace. So in your view that's rendered by the web fragment, you could use components. Um, you could use whatever you want. It's not, uh, it's not prescriptive in terms of exactly how it renders that front end. It, it just renders it. OK. Um, did that answer your question? Well, I. Um I sense that, that there are some like complications in practice. So I guess that, that if we uh, have to go with a fragment and React, we will face some complications in the future, right? With the React code? Um, so React is, not more, is no longer in control of the whole rendering process, right? Yeah, it entirely runs on the client, uh, whereas web fragments are rendered more on the server. Okay. You could render a page on the server that then, when it loads on the client, uh, makes use of mm. React components. Okay. Uh, but there's no reason why you couldn't use React components or anything else, jQuery, Angular components, if that's how you want to do it within a fragment as well. All right. Then I think I'll wait and see how, how it works. Thank cool. you. Right there. What are the immediate plans around optimization for mobile? From what I could understand from the presentation was that, OK, bringing an asset management system will save you some time of, uh, from the delivery of static assets. But there's an inherent slowness on all the web views uh, that, uh, that needs some native uh, development on the mobile front end to deal with. So any immediate plans to reduce the time? Because like on a browser, it's fine if you look at something for eight, nine seconds, and it doesn't load. Because there's so much real estate, you can switch windows, you can go to some other window, pass Absolutely. some time. But on a mobile, you are so focused that even waiting for three, four seconds, and the attention is lost. Yeah, totally. So that's a great question. Uh, the way it works now is we've got this huge uh, CSS bundle and JS bundle. And that's site-wide, or platform-wide, IDA-wide. Uh, we want to bundle these things more intelligently so that when you request a page, you only get the JavaScript that that page cares about or the CSS that that page cares about with the common stuff abstracted out into another bundle. So that would then get cached. Uh, the common shared stuff throughout all the pages would get cached. And uh, specific page-specific code bundled separately. Uh, we haven't done enough with that yet within the Django asset pipeline. Webpack just landed uh, in LMS and Studio, I think, within the past month. Uh, so there's still definitely some work to do there, but it comes with a lot of great plugins that enable use cases like this. Um, so yeah, we want to cut down that file size as much as possible. Yep. Yeah, so you talked about how React has this double-edged sword of interoperability with existing components and mm -hmm. the existing technologies. Um, what's the plan for actually getting rid of those existing legacy technologies in the code base? Uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, so the plan is future development will take place with React. Uh, I I believe we have a React rollout plan uh, within Confluence. I will dump that into Slack as well. The plan is to deprecate Bootstrap and encourage React by July of this year. Or not deprecate Bootstrap, but move to React by July, deprecate Bootstrap and previous uh, technologies by the end of 2017, and then in the future, uh, Anytime someone touches uh, like an old view, the encouragement is to re-implement it using React. 
Now, that does add a bit of developer overhead. Sometimes it's easier to just patch one line in a bootstrap view. But the hope is that uh, React, React is really easy to use. If you've, if you've used it before, it's easy to ramp up with. Uh, and we're hoping that as well uh, with the addition of the reusable components, it will make it a lot easier for developers to go in and do the right thing. Okay, right there. Thank you. Uh, I love the emojis. <laughs> and also just a big shout out to the team. I think that's a fantastic step forward. So just thinking a little bit about accessibility in sort of the grander real estate sense. Um, what sort of browsers are you looking to support? And fun joke, I still get asked for Internet Explorer 6. So <laughs> uh, we officially support the last two versions of every browser, uh, as well as IE11. So last two plus IE11 is our, our official support right now. We don't have a subset of supported mobile browsers right now. Uh, probably if we did come up with one, it would be based on uh, usage statistics for uh, our platform, but again, we want to hear from you about that. Uh, what, what browsers do we absolutely need to support? Because there's as many browsers almost as there are phones. And Mm -hmm. Is that a um, public resource? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, it's uh, on Open Edge. Uh, based on Open Edge, it's Open Edge. Open Edge. Yeah, we have a thirty percent mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll have to check that out. And now Edge is the least of other mobile. Yeah, well, we're working on it. <laughs> All right. We good? Yeah, so I think just announce the BOS again. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, BOF, yeah. Uh, BOF, 9 a.m. tomorrow, downstairs, breakfast area. Come find us, come chat with us. Uh, we wanna answer your questions. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>